And now it's time for the sponsor perspective portion of this band of our program. Before we get going, a quick clarification. While I'm conducting the interview uh, and these questions, and these questions are really mine, uh, the content of this portion of the event shouldn't be considered editorial, but it will still be cool. With that, I'm pleased to welcome my friend Brian Hendricks, Vice President of Public Policy and Public Affairs at Nokia Americas, who supported today's program. And it's been an awesome day. I've learned so much. Brian, uh, it's great to have you with us. Look, one of the things that's been haunting me today as I listen to the conversations is if you kind of created a map of America and you kind of covered who had access to connectivity and thus to education and to Sal Khan's Khan Academy, it wouldn't all be one color. You'd have these big blops here and there. You'd have them certain cities. You'd have them in rural areas. You'd have certain areas that weren't community. You've been at this a long time. What do we need to do to succeed that we're not doing now? Well, first of all, thank you for, for having me again. It's always a pleasure to, uh, to be here. I've learned a lot uh, through the programming today. Uh, you've actually touched on one of the key points that, that I mentioned in our last conversation about uh, deficiencies that we have in the information that's available to policymakers to deal with the broadband connectivity challenge, one of which is I'm not even sure we could construct an accurate map uh, to, mm. to facilitate what you were just describing because the, the process that we uh, use to develop that to the FCC needs to be updated significantly. But I think uh, one of the other things that we've been talking about is developing a, uh, a digital connectivity commission, something that can actually take place outside of traditional Washington environment, more like the 9-11 commission, other uh, kinds of commissions that have been put together to really do an in-depth study on exactly what's going on out there, because uh, we still have a paucity of information about uh, adoption patterns, why people adopt, why they don't, what limits they face, is it financial, is it device, is it network availability related? Um, so we need better information. But we also are in a, in a really interesting time right now with the pandemic going on. Uh, there's some very interesting things going on um, school districts, uh, several of whom have, have been represented here today in your programming, but many others that we're dealing with, actually have great information, it turns out, uh, in a lot of cases about uh, the percentage of their students that have access to, to broadband and those that do not, those who have devices, those who do not. And they're doing some pretty innovative things right now, uh, which have some lessons that we could probably uh, derive from that. So uh, the purpose of that kind of commission would be really to just collect this information into and distill it into recommendations that policymakers could deal with. I think the, the top line argument that I'd make is that while Washington, in my judgment, can can fund it and can facilitate discussion about it, it can't fix this problem. Um, we've spent a lot of money, over $25 billion over the last five years, for pretty pretty marginal returns uh, in terms of value. So we need to greatly expand the options, the innovation, the tools, um, the technologies, the business models that are being used to fill this in. And that's probably not going to happen if we do it in a traditional Washington top-down approach. I mean, I think, I think what you said is very powerful. And if I, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm hearing you say it's not a dollar's problem. I'm hearing you say, you know, there are other things, you know, that, that, that can get gravity to work differently. Um, and one of the things I've, you know, touched on with uh, FCC Commissioner Rosenworcel uh, and some others this morning is, you know, I'm familiar with uh, uh, some non-urban areas that struggle with this issue. They struggle within trying to put in their own municipal networks because they don't have carriers that are going out there. Are there ways in which we can get new partnerships or we can at least get um, municipal networks, the authorities and the ability to operate in certain places so that they can help deliver? Because I know in, you know, Eastern Shore of Maryland, it's a tough thing. Uh, there's a fight between, you know, carriers. Is that an issue that you think matters? Uh, yes, I think the issue matters. I think the facts are, are really critically important as well. Um, and when I talk about how Washington has limited the uh, the options uh, solution set, uh, municipal broadband comes up frequently. The, the uh, sort of currency of the realm in terms of argument to policymakers is that these are white elephants. They're a giant mm. waste of money. Um, Nokia currently has 29 municipal broadband partners around the country. Each and every one of them is profitable. So we can, mm. we've demonstrated that that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. There are just certain things that you need in order to make uh, a solution like that work, including a really good 
business plan for monetization and, and modernization of the network moving forward. Um, but the good news here is that technology is, is um, a great catalyst for change, uh, particularly with the arrival of 5G and what, what is capable there. Um, we're actually in discussions right now with a lot of school districts around the country who have reached out to ask whether we can use unlicensed spectrum that the commission has has made available recently in the CBRS band to do private LTE networks, um, you know, for the areas and the neighborhoods that feed the schools, hmm. um, sort of as an extension of what the, the school's own wide area network may have when the students and the faculty are in the building, but that doesn't help them when they're not in the building. But if you have the ability to utilize um, you know, unlicensed spectrum, you, you might actually, in, in some places, be able to create uh, private networks that are capable of, of filling this need. That will not, however, be the case mm. every place. Right. So that's what I mean when I say that you really have to take a look at all the different technologies available, satellite, fiber, mm. um, you know, wireless. All of these things have to be taken into account. And unfortunately, when we do this traditionally through the Washington approach, you will end up getting the solution set constrained lobbying for particular business plans or particular technologies means we end up making issues like how fast broadband has to be to be called broadband. That becomes the hill we die on at the FCC, not how do we actually make sure that you've got connectivity out in communities. Well, I, so, I, I just, I, I mean, I don't mean, I just want to, I want to finish on that point uh, with you is, you know, sometimes I think it's useful to have a North Star and anchor in a discussion to look at it. And I'm wondering, you know, whether it is trying to figure out how we uh, approach, you know, the mother sitting in a car near a Starbucks or a McDonald's with three kids trying to take advantage of, you know, connectivity and Wi-Fi there, whether that's, you know, part of what we're trying to sort of solve in this, um, as opposed to the parochial stakeholder interests of any business or something. And, and I'm wondering, could you just spend just a minute, you know, just give us a quick picture of how the Digital Connectivity Commission might address that person and her struggles? Well, I think you're starting with, uh, you define the problems you're trying to solve first, right? That's what the 9-11 Commission did. We had very, very specific failures that were observed, right? There, there were people passing notes across rubble piles because they didn't have, you know, a common communications platform. And thus, one of the recommendations born out of all of that analysis and expert testimony from from first responders, from, from um, communications providers, was that you needed to have a separate a communications common platform for first responders, and now we have FirstNet as a result of that. Uh, so I think that you have, you start by defining what are the failures hmm. out there, right? Some of it is network availability. They're just places that are either not covered today or where the business case is very difficult to square. Hmm. Um, those places are very expensive, and so you know that when you approach that, you're going to need to use whatever technologies can be made available, and you're also going to need uh, a bulk of resources to, to be reserved for that. But what that means, because there is some finite amount of money that will be made available for this, you better make sure you're spending the rest of the money uh, in the most effective way to get the best yield. So that means identifying additional technologies, additional approaches, including distribution channels. I mean, what we're finding so far, and I'm not suggesting schools are going to be a perfect distribution point, but five months ago, I wouldn't have guessed that school districts had amazing information about the broadband connectivity and device uh, availability and utilization of their their customers. But it turns out that they do. It turns out we don't really have that information at mm. the federal level. So find, providing a, a process where that kind of information can be brought together, um, directed at specific problems, that's going to translate to specific recommendations. And there'll be recommendations for rural areas, tribal areas, the, the unserved urban core, the underserved urban core. It may be different technology mixes, mm. different programs, and different approaches. But, you know, if we start this with a rulemaking at the FCC with lots of comments from vested business interests, you throttle down the solution set to the same things that we've tried for the last 10 to 15 years with very modest results. And that's just a recipe for failure. Well, Brian Hendricks, uh, Vice President of P Policy and Pub Public Affairs at Nokia Americas. I always learn from these sessions. I um, mean, we'll have to do it more often. Thank you so much for joining us uh, and sharing your thoughts today. Thanks, Steve.